Welcome to our second Homeschool Connection Night for Math. I really appreciate you coming because this workshop is going to guide you through three of the most challenging concepts in fourth grade in math for the year. The other concept that's going to be other most challenging for past experience is going to be fractions. So this is going to be one that's super important to come to, and the fractions one especially. All the other ones are also important, but these are the ones where the students have struggled most in the past. Um, the thing that's going to be different about this homeschool connection night than the last math one is, other than multiplication, we have not started this stuff yet. So you guys are actually going to be ahead of the game. We touched on division in last night's flipped video and tonight's flipped video as well. Um, so you're going to be ahead of the game. We won't actually start long division till not next week, but the following week. I forgot next week is a short week, so we're not going to start on long division quite yet. Um, you have the paper, so feel free to take notes if you'd like. So we're going to start off right away with talking about word problems. And like I said in the whole numbers night that we had, that the word problems are kind of written to somewhat trick the students. Um, and so to get them prepared, we try to do in class activities and tests accordingly to get them, not necessarily trick them, but just to get them in the habit of learning how to do that. Um, the biggest mistake of, uh, is going to be when the students choose the wrong operation, whether they multiply when they're supposed to divide, or divide rather than multiply, which is the focus of the night's flip video that they're supposed to be doing, um, or not doing the problem fully. They might think it's a single step problem, well, it's a multi-step problem. We'll talk about that a little bit more as we go along. So in fourth grade, we're going to do multiplications two different ways. One is going to be the traditional method, which is the one factor on top and the one underneath, and you cross multiply and you have the zero. That's the way that I was taught when I was coming up through the years, and that's probably how you were taught and probably most comfortable with. The other way that you've seen already at this point, and your child had some of the teachers in third grade have been practicing for about a year now, is lattice box. That's the way that I, that was first introduced to me in college, and it was a little confusing to me at first. But then as I worked around with it in college, I realized it is very beneficial for the students of all abilities because it's a little bit more visual. It's really easy to work with. You can even do it up through and including decimals. And if we have time at the end, I'll show you how you do a lattice box with decimals, because I know that's one complaint some upper grades have had before, that you can't do lattice box with decimals, but you actually can do lattice box with decimals. So that's something good to know. Right? But, so to talk about why it's important, or why we choose to do the lattice box, is for the students who have a hard time with kind of complex abstract thought, you know, cross multiplying and pairing stuff, it requires them only to know their basic facts versus having to know, you know, you multiply this and you put one place value down there and you take the next one up and then you have to add this. This requires them to only know their basic facts, which is super important for having mastery of multiplication facts. It also, because it's so visual, it makes sure that they can multiply every digit and not forgetting to multiply a digit because if you're doing three digits on top and two digits underneath, it's really easy to forget to multiply one digit. But with the lattice box, since it's so visual, you can't really ever forget to do a box. And it gives the students a way to check the traditional method. If they try the traditional method and they're not comfortable with it, this gives them a way to check it. So a common mistake is going to be not knowing their basic facts. I've had students in the past, and even some students this year, who understand the process in multiplication. But what happens with them is they slow, they have to slow down so much because they have to count on their fingers to know their basic facts, especially the six, sevens, and eights, are ones that they just need to memorize because you can count by threes easy, you can count by five, by tens pretty easy. You have the nine strict for your fingers. Counting by fours is a little bit more challenging, but it's still manageable. But the six, sevens, and eights, they really just need to know their facts. Those are going to be the most challenging for everybody. Um, so knowing basic facts is going to be huge. They need to know those as soon as possible if they don't already. Rushing through is going to be a common mistake in any math thing, but especially multiplication. Not checking with both methods. Well, going back to like what I was saying, they're not fully comfortable with one method. It's always helpful to check with both methods because if they get two different answers, then one method they've done wrong. I mean, not understand the word problem, but we'll talk about that more in later slides. So for the traditional multiplication method, you can see this is kind of how I have them do it. And I'll, mo I'll do, I'll model one so it doesn't look like this, but they just take the, the problem and they make sure they line up the place values. Then they multiply all the top numbers by the ones place, which in this case is the eight. 
and then they need to make sure they carry over and add, and I will model this. Um, and then, which we haven't, so what we've been doing in class so far is when they have one a one-digit factor on the bottom. Next week, we will do when we move into having a two-digit factor on the bottom, um, so that when they do have the two-digit factor, when they move over, they're really not multiplying by seven, they're multiplying by 70. So to get around that, they need to put a zero down there. Some teachers will have them put an X or just something just to represent that they've moved over in place value. Then they multiply like normal, and then they move, and then they add it all up. Those are called partial products, those two things. I'm going to model one on the smart board for you, just so that makes a little bit more sense than looking at the picture that's already been done. Um, so if we have, and I got a brand new smart board, so it actually works on like last time when we were here and it wasn't working. Um, so thank you, technology department. Um, so if we're doing the traditional method, we have 894 times 35. So I'm, I work with one's place first because that's just how the number system works. So if we do five times four, that would give you 20. And the one's place is always going to go down first. You carry up the tens place and I circle it. I put a plus sign next to it just so they really remember you need to do something about that number. So then we circle the next one and nine times five is 45 plus two. So it'd be 45 plus two, that would be 47. So again, the ones place goes down, they carry up the four, because that's in the tens place, and they circle here. Five times four, or five times eight is 40, plus four would be 44. So if we didn't have the three, that's what we've been working on in class, the multiplying by one factor. But we will start next week, so this gives you a little bit of a branch of strike for the students to realize what they should be doing. Um, we will start moving into the two-digit factor. So when they move over, I tell them move, when you move over, add a zero. So I'm moving over, I'm adding a zero. That's just so I'm now constantly multiplying by 10. So now I do three times four, which is 12. The one, the two goes down and I carry up the one. They obviously won't have multicolor markers when they do this all the time, but for the sake of your visual, it makes more sense this way. Three times nine is 27 plus one would be 28. So the eight goes down, the two goes up. Three times eight is 24, plus two is 26. So then they have their two partial products, and now they need to add them up. So zero plus zero is zero, seven plus two is nine, four plus eight is 12. Then they just follow the normal adding rules. One plus four is five, plus six is 11, which gives you that much, 31,290. And if I did that correctly, they match. Um, so that is, for many students, they will understand that and they can roll with traditional and that's perfectly fine. I will teach them both methods. They will practice both methods. At some point I would say, choose what method is best for you. I kind of you will know, encourage them in one direction or another, depending on what I'm seeing them in class, which method to use. Um, but I will say most students for at least the first couple times working with us, last box is going to be significantly easier for them. The thing that they're going to mess, mess up on most is just all of this stuff because it's a lot written on there. Moving over, they might forget the zero, which will then throw them off by about 10,000. Um, so this is one way. If your child gets it right off that, great. If not, last box might be helpful as well. Lattice box, as you can see, is a little less cramped, it's a little bit more spread out, it's a little bit more visual. So the first step is to draw the box, and when I'm modeling one, I'll actually show you how I have them draw the box, and it helps them set it up. You put the first factor on the top and on the sides, and then you put the diagonals. The most important thing when you're putting in the diagonals, on this one and this one, it's really easy because it's one diagonal. But some students will try to go diagonal from here all the way over there, which then cuts up the boxes really strangely. So I tell them, take each little square itself and go corner to corner, and then extend, corner to corner, and extend. So, like I said, we've only been doing that much, so it's not an issue with their diagonals now, but next week when we get into the two digit factors, their diagonals might get a little more confusing. Um, 
so they multiply up and over. So what I tell them to do is physically put your finger in the box, go all the way, don't actually do anything with the box. Um, put your finger in the box, go all the way up until you run to a num number, come back down, and then go all the way over until you run to a number. So we say up and over, up and over, six times seven is 42. I don't have an example on this, but if it were like one times seven, you would need to put zero seven, because if you put seven zero, that's 70, which is slightly different than seven. Um, so that, and then you add the diagonals, that's another thing that might get confusing. I've had students will try to add straight down, because that's how they're used to with addition and subtraction, which you need to add along the diagonals. I tell them kind of think of this as a sandwich, add this stuff in between the sandwich, and it goes there. You'll see like two or four plus five is nine plus four is 13 plus two is 15. So just like in adding, up and down, you can't have more than one number in each place, right? So that goes down and that gets carried up. So I'll model an example of that, which again is a little bit more user friendly than that drawing. So what I have them do, and if you'll notice it will be, it's the same exact problem, I'm just kind of demonstrating that you can do it either way, come up with the same answer. So I draw my rectangle first, and I put the number on the top, and the number on the side. Then what I do, and this is something I'm doing new this year because I realize it makes a lot more sense to do it this way than in past years. In past years, I had them put the lines in first and then put the numbers in. And I realize that doesn't make sense because they like not make their big box big enough. So I have them put the numbers in first and then just divide the numbers by their place value. And it's working pretty well so far. Um, so I'm happy that I came up with that. So oh, I can come up with that. I saw a video about that. I'm like, I'm <laughs> um, so you go corner to corner and then extend corner to corner and extend with what I was talking about. Well, sometimes they'll go try to go from this corner all the way to the corner and you see it screws it all up. So they need to take it one step at a time. Corner, 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 extend, corner, corner, and extend. You can even as they're working on at home, have them say that corner to corner extend. It'll just kind of, the, the auditory will help them see it visually as well. So then I tell them, pick box, go up until you run into it. A number, so they run up to the four, they come back down, they run to the three, that would be 12. Again, I'll go down, I'll run up, I'll go up until I run into a number, come down until I run to another number, four times five is 20. Here I would be nine times three is 27. Here it would be nine times five is 45. Here it would be eight times three would be 24. Here it would be eight times five is 40. You saw there, all I needed was knowledge of my basic facts. I didn't have to worry about putting one place value up and carrying the other and then doing adding as well. And then it just makes it a little, it simplifies the whole process and they'll still end up with the same answer. So then I'm now adding the diagonals. We'll see that zero by itself is zero. Two plus two is four plus five is nine. One plus seven is eight plus four is 12. So the two goes down and I carry it up to the one. One plus two is three, plus four is seven, plus four is 11. I didn't know. One plus two is three, so 31,290, which matches. Awesome. Last year when I did this, I didn't get them to match. It was super embarrassing. Um, so I'm glad I got them to match this time. So lattice box, by and large, it might be confusing for your student or even for you at first glance because it's not exactly the most traditional thing. Um, but it makes sense for the students because if they forget to multiply a factor, they'll see it really quickly versus with when they're circling all their factors and traditional, they might not see you, especially by the time they get to right here and they've already circled the digits, they might just miss the nine because it's kind of already been circled. So the lattice box is gonna be one way that's gonna be helpful for them, lays it out a little bit more visually. So to move on to some word problems, which we, when I was doing the flip videos, I started right off the bat with found the word problems just to, rather than think of it as just row multiplication, we kind of start presenting it in word problem form just to get them on a jump start. It says, a factory makes 445 breath mints per day. How many breath mints will the factory make in 80 days? So that's how much they're making in one day, the 445. 
and rather than just doing 445 plus 80, which that's not a very good factor, they're only making like a couple hundred in a day, like their profit margins might be very low, but that's neither here nor there. Um, so it's it's not 445 plus 80, because that's not saying they made this many one day and 80 the next day, you know, they're combined. They're saying they made it once on, or 445 on this day, 445 on this day, so on and so forth, and I'm not gonna say it 80 times in a row. Same thing for the next one, it says it's a candy jar, jar no, candy store bought 17 jars of candy. Each jar has 338 pieces. How many of pieces of candy are there all together? You notice all together is also a clue word for addition, but that's just because all the patients just repeated addition. So you're gonna see they're gonna share a lot of the same clue words. But again, if they think about it, they have 17 jars of candy and this one is 338 all the way down the line. It's not saying that there's 338 pieces and then there's 17 more over there. 25 bags of candy, or 25 bags filled with coins, that many in each bag, how many are there in all? Again, sharing some clue words with multiplication, or with addition, in all, and same concept. They just need to sometimes kind of slow down, think it through. I'm always perfectly okay with them sketching it out. I wouldn't necessarily be okay with them sketching a bag and putting 943 pieces, dots in it, and then 25 more. But if they think it out and kind of sketch a rough sketch of it, that'd be a really good way for them to illustrate their thinking and prove to themselves, not even just to me, but just prove to themselves why they're choosing to do that specific operation. On the other side, there are also multi-step problems in multiplication, just like there are multi-step problems with addition and subtraction. So it says, Hank does 25 jumping jacks three times a day. He does this for eight days. How many jumping jacks has Hank done? And I would bet you any amount of money that on the SOL, it would have 75 as one of the answers because 25 times three is 75. But they need to see that that's how much, 75 is how much he does in one day but they want to know about eight days. So we'll walk that through the first time we do it in class and in an we'll kind of have them, let them kind of make their own mistake and be like, well, and by and large, most of the students will get 75 as their first answer. And I said, well, I got whatever 75 times eight is. And they'll be like, no way, that's so much more. And I said, well, let's read it. And then so I'll sketch it out for them. Sketching is going to be a really good way for them to, like I said, explain their thinking. Mary is holding a box with three jars inside. Inside each jar are 12 marbles. How many of those marbles would be in six of these boxes? So answer choices on the S12 would probably be 36. It would probably also be 72 because 12 times 6 is going to be 36. 6 times 12 is going to be 72. There would probably even be 18 there with 3 times 6. It's going to give you all the combinations that you could arrive at if you don't understand the problem. This would be, that one would be kind of hard to sketch. I don't know if people want to sketch like a stick figure doing jumping jacks. But this one would be a really good one. Draw a box and then within that box, three jars, draw 12 marbles inside the jar, and then kind of repeat that six times. Um, all the students really like to draw. This would be a good way for them to do some constructive drawing. Um, so it's just really slowing down and really thinking about what the work problem is asking them, rather than just trying to go for the speed. It's kind of funny, in math, we want them to know their math facts would be split, but then when they're doing more multi-step problems, we want them to slow down, so it's kind of, a trade off if you wanted to go fast for one thing and then slow for the other. So, ways to practice. In addition to the flipped videos, which I did put ways to practice because I didn't record the flipped videos for three, three digits by two digits, um, but I do have the flipped videos for three digits by one digit. IXL topic D, it's going to be all about multiplication, all the way from multiplication facts all the way down to. I don't remember what the last one is, but they have like 26 different things that are just based on multiplication. It will cover traditional color lattice. We'll also cover another method that's called box multiplication, which is just ultra products. They're welcome to try that one out, but we're not going to do that in class, but that's just another strategy um, to be aware. Easiest way to practice this is, which is one of the students' favorite things to kind of do in class right now, just make up some numbers. Just throw them two different numbers, have them multiply them. You can have them do it in both methods and do it. You could get set or nine number tiles and number them from one to nine, get an egg carton on the top row of the egg carton, put down three, and put down two numbers on the bottom of the egg carton. That's kind of a self, um, I don't know what we're looking for here, but basically where they just do the, um, it's they're never gonna run out of combinations. It's always gonna have it there. Um, you can do this in the car, it's really simple. I'd recommend, if they're doing this, have a calculator nearby so they can check their answers too, just to definitively make sure that they are true. 
one that the parents and the student, well, the student more so than the parents last year, enjoyed was multiplication race with the child, where you have to solve, both of you have to solve the problem in both methods, because as adults, we're pretty good at the traditional, but most, mostly lattice is a little bit newer, unless you've had a child in my class in the past and you've already done lattice, um, or any class that has done lattice, which is your same class. Um, the parents sometimes get tripped up by the lattice because it's a little bit newer, and you'll find that your student will actually end up surpassing you. Hopefully that's the goal, eventually. But you guys come and have here, so maybe you'll beat them. Um, so we're going to switch topics into long division. And long division always sounds a lot scarier to kids and parents. It's really not that scary. It's just the fact that it sounds scary, I guess. We do it where there's a three-digit dividend, which is like the number inside the house, if you think the little multiplication thing looks like a house. Three digits inside and a one digit outside, which is the divisor. Um, and we only have one method. So it's, well, there are a couple different methods that if students not grasping the traditional, I do have other methods that we can talk about. But for the sake of tonight, we're just going to talk about one, uh, the one method. When they get to fifth grade and upper grades, they will have to do two digits outside. But I have had students in the past who have done two digits outside the house, the box. And it's, it seems as, it follows the same process no matter what. It's, we use the mnemonic, does McDonald's sell burgers raw? And it's divide, multiply, subtract, bring down, and repeat. Last year, what I did was on Sharpie, I wrote does or D M S B R on my hand in Sharpie with the symbols. And I had on my hand, so it helped them all that. And a kid walked in the next day with that written on their hand in Sharpie. And I was like, please tell me you asked your parents first. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, they thought it was a good idea. And I was like, oh, dodge that bullet. So if in a couple of weeks you chop ball your seat in the flip video, because I will do it in the video. Um, if your child gets a Sharpie out and so wants to start drawing on, your, on their fingers, I'm sorry, but they're learning, so let them do it. Um, and multiple, long division, you can always check that to make sure it's right with um, multiplication. I'll show you exactly how that works. So common mistakes, again, not going and going back to not knowing their basic facts. I cannot stress enough how important knowing their, and it's not even their division facts that will trip them up if they don't know their multiplication facts, because you can work your multiplication facts backwards to use them in division. They need to know their basic facts. They really just need to know. I can't say that I'm going to stop saying that at this point. If they skip a I feel it. I feel it. You don't have to say it anymore. I'll go home all night and practice. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, so if they skip a step in the process, which is why I had them, I drew on my hands because I could show, like, look, I have to pull down every finger until I can start over again. Um, putting a number in the wrong spot, if they bring down a number and put it, or they bring down a number too early, or they bring down something wrong, or forgetting to check it because if they don't, if they don't check it, they run that risk of having it wrong. So, it's very wordy right there. That's a very hyped up definition. I'll just kind of walk through it. So you set up the problem like this, and you see if the first number, the divisor on the outside of the house can go into the first digit. And I know nine cannot go into one, because if I have one, I can't get any groups of nine out of that. So then I would move over. Or some students, to get them in practicing the habit, I'll say, well, I can get it out zero times, and then I actually have them do a first step. Most of the time, we'll just have them move forward. So now I say, how many times can I get 9 out of 14? They can do this by knowing their basic facts. They can know this by looking at their fingers, objects, all that kind of stuff. In summer school, when I was working with it with some of my students, I would get out a bunch of objects, and I would say, here's this many. Start taking groups of 9 now, and putting, which was a really good strategy <laughs> until we got to, like, I had to get out 58 objects and have them count out 9 groups. That took a while. Um, that would take a while for even me or anybody, but it's that is a good visual way to show them exactly what you mean. So you can get nine out of 14 one time. So that would be the divide step because you're dividing nine into 14. Then the multiply step, which is the pointer finger, you do nine times one, and that gives you nine. So that's divide, that's multiply. Then subtract, you just subtract that, and you get five. Then you bring down, and now you have 58, and then you repeat and start the whole process over again. So how many times can I get nine out of 58? You can get that out six times. So nine times, so that was divide. Nine times six is 56 or 54. So that's multiply, then subtract, and then you bring down. Well, there's nothing left to bring down, so you would skip that part. 
And so then rather than repeat, that actually becomes remainder. So you bring it up, and now it's your remainder instead. So to model this on the smart board, and I'll show you how you can kind of, they can kind of reverse, I'll show you how they can reverse their multiplication facts to help them with division. So if we have four on the outside and eight, 75. Terrible. So how many times can I get four out of eight? Two. For two. 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 So then, four, so that was divide. So then multiply four times two is, then you subtract it, and that's zero, and then I bring it down. So four, how many, <laughs> how many times can I pull four out of seven? One, so the one goes up there. Four times one is four minus seven. And they bring down the five. Now, they might not know that those were two pretty easy to figure out how many times four. But if they don't know that, what I have them do alongside is I have them just start writing down their four times tables. So four, eight, 12, 16, 20. 24, 28, 32, 36. Now they see that 36 is bigger than 35, so they know they won't be able to pull that out. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 8 was the closest they could get without going over. Kind of like, what's that game show? Race three? Yeah. Um, so then the 8 goes up there. 4 times 8 is, and if they, if they, this is, if they write it down alongside, it's really nice because it, if, it, if they forgot in the time writing up there, they can always look back and see it's already written there. Rather than having to re-multiply, it's written down right there for them. So 4 times 8 is 32. Subtract, and that will give you 3. There's nothing left to bring down. So that now is brought up, and that's 218, remainder 3. Yes, 3 for 3 now. Uh, so 218, remainder 3. This strategy will be very helpful if they, because most students can, you know, keep skip counting. The thing that will sometimes get frustrating for them is if it's like, by the time they get to here, then they have to skip count, and then they get to the next one, then they have to skip count. But if, as long as they have written once, it's not like they would have to write it a second time. But that's a really good strategy, how they can kind of reverse engineer the multiplication facts to help them with division. The next slide is going to be how you use multiplication to check that they have it correct. So this is done to make sure that the answer is right because they can um, just make sure that it's right without having to ask me or a calculator. So they take the number that's on top of the house and on the side, which is the quotient and the divisor, and they multiply those. I don't care how they multiply it, they can do lattice, they can do traditional, however they want to. Then they need to add up or add in the remainder. And if this if this whole sum, and yeah, I guess that's sum, sum matches the number inside the house, then they know they're correct. Biggest common mistake, well, they don't make this mistake to like, will model me making this mistake and I'll stick them in their head, or stick in their head. I'll be like, well, that 144 doesn't match the 148. No, you need to add the the four. So letting them catch me in my mistake is a really good way for them to kind of hammer it home that they need to do that. So to demonstrate that for this one, all right. So I will take the number that's on the top, 218 times four, and I'll do four times eight is 32. That's seven. And eight. Now I see that I have my remainder, so I need to make sure I add in the remainder. At this point is when I would be like, they don't match, I must be wrong. I have to start all over. And then I'm like, no, you don't. You just need to actually go back and read it. Plus three, eight, 75. And then they match. And then they know that this answer up here is definitively correct. 
So that is um, how they can use, you can see multiplication really does come in play with division, even though they're opposite operations. A solid understanding of multiplication will work um, for division. On a multiple choice test, one thing that they can actually do if they are kind of struggling with um, division, which I'll tell them this, but I would prefer for them to make sure that they are, they can show long division. If it's a multiple choice test and it says like, it has this problem and then it gives them four choices and for the life of them, they might not be able to remember how to do multiplication or division. I'll tell them, multiply the small number by the answer for all four, whichever one you end up getting the number inside the box, then you're going to be correct. That's kind of making the test work for them. Um, if they're faster with multiplication, that's kind of one way to do it. Kind of defeats the purpose of me understanding if they know how to do long division. But if they that's using their work, that's working smarter, not necessarily harder. Um, I've had I've had students in past years realize that while we're taking like a benchmark or something. And we'll be like, cool, get the right answer. That's right. Um, now I'm going to give you one without answers, and <laughs> you have to show me it. Um, so examples for division, luckily we only do single set division, so it's not like going to be like they're going to have to divide this amount and then divide it more, um, or they have to multiply something and then divide it, it's just going to be straight um, division. So it says Dawson Trucking has a 912 dollars to pay for bridge tolls if each toll six dollars how many tolls can the company pay so i tell them which i think was actually in the last night's video and tonight's video um, if they give you a total amount and then they're breaking it up that's going to be division if they are asking you to find a total it's going to be addition or multiplication um, so same same concept in with the one with darren darren made 533 pieces of pink riddle to share with his friends he put nine pieces in each tin how many tins was Darren able to fill? So he has a total of 533 pieces of peanut you know, brittle, which feels like a lot to me. Um, and so he's putting nine pieces in each tin. So he's got nine tins, he's got 533, he's gonna go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Da, 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 da. Hopefully he does that smarter. He just long divides it, figures out how many he needs to put in each tin. Jane is building six birdhouses. She has 302 for forest used. Apparently I just buy 300 boards, get two free was the promotion they were writing there. And so she needs to change how many does she, if she uses all her boards, how many will be left over. Basically, to know when they're using division is they are given a big amount and they need to break it into a smaller amount. Kind of, to kind of make the test work again, against, for them, not against them. Um, knowing that there's going to be a three digit number and then a one digit number, most likely it's going to have them break it up because we don't do three digits. If they see like a three digit number and a two digit number in there, they know it's not going to be long division because we don't do long division with two digits outside the house. So that's kind of ways they can use work smarter, not necessarily harder. All right. So ways to practice this, flip videos whenever they are put up. Um, I excel topic E, just like in topic D, where it's going to start with their division fact, sort of their multiplication fact, and go all the way down. It's going to have a whole ton of resources from basic, um, here's two numbers, divide them. So here's word problems. I, if memory serves, E8 is going to just give them long division problem over and over and over where it's going to be three digits and then um, one digit. That really sticks out to me because I kind of remember telling students repetitively last year, can you practice on long division, keep going, E8, E8, E8. Um, if we have time at the end, I'll kind of show you how to navigate through IXL a little bit. Kind of the same process of the multiplication, just give them two numbers and tell them to divide it. It's going to be a very easy way. Or similar to the egg carton, you can put, um, let's put help if I had it in right now. Put one digit here, skip a space, and then put three digits. So that kind of sets up a problem. Again, um, if they are doing it on a calculator to check themselves, it's a little bit different because most calculators won't say like 342, remainder three, they'll say like 342 point, da 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 da. What, what you can do to check or teach them to do it. You subtract out the whole number, so it's 342.4. You subtract out 342, so you get up 0.4. Then you just multiply it by whatever the divisor was. So it'd be like 342 times five. Generally, we don't use calculators in class so that often, so we don't really talk through exactly how to use a calculator. But um, that's going to be a way that you guys can check if you want to do a long division yourself. So elapsed time is the skill that 
will be a little bit challenging for students based on how our number system is set up and just the way numbers are set up with us having base 10 where every 10 is, comes a new um, place value. Whole number, or time is different because every 60 minutes is a new hour. So it's kind of a paradigm shift for them to remember that oh, we're not doing 10s or 100s now, now we're going by 60. They will only have to find a last time if it's given a start time or an end time. According to the stuff that the Virginia Department of Education puts out, that's what it says. On the flip side, I have seen and released items and released tests that they have put out there where it will say, like, he started this time, he had to, he did it for this long, what time did he end? Even though the standard itself says a uh, start time and an end time. So you can see it's kind of frustrating from the teacher perspective trying to figure out what we are supposed to teach because they don't exactly come out fourth grade and say it's like a 47 page document you have to like sit through to really figure out what you're supposed to judge which would be like teach numbers um but so we will because the timeline method is very easy for them um but the when they have to add time on or count back that's the challenging i'm sure the two of you probably might remember that from fourth grade. um so like i said we can kind of look at a clock and figure it out pretty easily. The students at this level aren't quite ready for that, so it's a little bit more difficult. Common mistakes, the biggest common mistake is not knowing how to read an analog clock, which kind of makes sense because you don't see that kind of clock as much anymore. It's more digital clocks. I mean, I wear this more for show than actually looking at the time. Um, I use my phone to check the time most of the time. But that is something that they do need to know. And that's something that we can talk about, but it's just learning how to read clock. Sometimes it will get them a clock base, sometimes it will get them a digital time. Switching over from AM to PM, knowing like after 12 it goes, it starts over and it's like one, two, three. That's sometimes, sometimes they'll just want to keep going up, like 13, 14. And so, Mr. B, this is never getting back to eight. Uh, or not regrouping for 60 minutes, which isn't as huge of a deal with last time, but that's more counting up or counting back. So the timeline method is when a start time and end time is given. So for example, it says Mr. B started washing dishes at 8.45 a.m. and finished at 12.05 p.m. How long was he washing his dishes for? And why did he have that many dishes? Would be <laughs> maybe wash dishes in the I get office. very distracted. Um, <laughs> yeah. Or I'll, I like when I wash dishes, it doesn't really take me that long, but I wash sure. most of the time. Most of the time, yeah. So these are not true stories? <laughs> Some of them are. I'll let you choose which one. Um, the oh, timeline method. So I tell them to draw their timeline. They basically make a capital I that looks like it's falling down because that's the best way for them to remember. They put their start time at the top, the, that part, and they put a, their end time at that part. They add lines for each full hour in between, not necessarily just every hour in between. So rather than doing like the next the next whole hour would be nine o'clock, not nine forty-five, because they're going to the next full hour. I've seen other ways where they've done it to like eight forty-five, nine forty-five, and that works sometimes. But this is the way that, generally speaking, kind of makes a little bit more sense. Um, the other way we will sometimes practice that, but this is the way that I found works the best. So they keep going every whole hour until they get to, they can't do another whole hour. So they couldn't do one o'clock because that's after 12.05. So then they jump from that first one and 8.45 to nine o'clock is 15 minutes. That one, out of all, I tell them that they have three sets of jumps to do. They have a minute jump, they have all their hour jumps, and then they have a minute jump. This one is always the easiest one for them because it's, a whole hour to the next whatever it is. So it's literally whatever the after the colon is. This one is easy for them because it's just jumping how many times. This is the one they will struggle with most, especially for some reason, if it's like 8.35 or 8.25. They want to reverse them and think that it's 25 minutes or 35 minutes. The quarter hours are, they don't generally screw up. The half hours, they don't screw up. It's really the 25, well, the 20, the 25, the 30, Five and the 40 is where they get most confused. So I tell them, I mean, there's always a clock in the room. Look at the clock and just count by fives until you get to the next hour. Or if the alternative is, and a student came up with this last year, I kind of kick myself for not thinking of this, 
they could subtract the minutes from 60 because that's the next whole hour and work backwards that way. So that was a good way that the student taught me to do something. So they jumped 15 minutes and they jumped one hour, two hour, three hours. I had some students will label one hour, one hour, one hour. Some students go right to the juice and just do three hours. It doesn't matter me. And then the last jump, which is the easy one. Then they just add it up, um, which I didn't think there. Um, so three hours plus 15 minutes plus five minutes will give you three hours and 20 minutes. In the event, if this were if this would have been like 8:15, jump to nine would be 45 minutes, and then this was like 12:30, so that would give you 75 minutes. I'll say, well, 75 minutes doesn't go on a clock, so they have this is where the crossing over the 60 gets confusing because they have to take 60 minutes away from the, the minutes and rather than give 60 over, they're only giving one over. So they they grasp the concept that there are 60 minutes in an hour, but the transfer over is where it's going to be a little bit more difficult. However, most problems will not necessarily have that crossover. That's more when they have the adding up time or counting back time, which allegedly isn't as big of a focus. So to model that one, so I'm saying that my, I don't think I said this is not go over 60. Um, if I go over mine, I have my capital I on its side. Then I have eight, 18 here, and I have three, 43 here. So then I put in my individual hours, so that would be nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, and 3 o'clock. I, I did a really good job spacing those out. And now I'm going to do my jumps. Now, you can probably look at that and figure it out. Off the top of your head, relatively quickly, I think it's 42 minutes. Um, but if you can't look at that off the top of your head and figure it out, you can always subtract it from 60. So 60 minus 42. 18, right? <laughs> okay, it's a good thing oh, <laughs> I was like, what happened there? So I was checking it just to, just to make sure you were paying attention. So, yes, uh, so 42 minutes, I was correct in a roundabout way. See, I was showing you that you can use the multiplication to, uh, I'm just going to move on. <laughs> So I've got 42 minutes. I was confused. I was like, how did I manage? Yeah, I'm just back on this. Yeah, I'm still just distraught about getting a message that I added one plus one from a couple of weeks ago. I haven't. Yeah, OK, OK. All right. So then we got one, two, three, four, five, six hours. Then six hours jumping would give you 43 minutes. All right, so six hours, and I'll just add those up about six hours, 43 minutes, plus 42 minutes. This is where we're going to run into. It's going to be over 60. So it's going to be five, eight, and six. Now, so what I have them do here is I have them subtract 60 and immediately add one over there. That just seems to be the way to remember that if you're going to take away 60, add one on the other side. So they know that's going to end up being 7, 25, and it's really 7 hours, 25 minutes. That's the first thing. Um, so 7 hours, 25 minutes, that's modeling the over 60, which generally might not happen, but they do need to be aware of how to treat that if it does happen. So for examples for elapsed time, um, this first one, Mr. Jones went golfing at 4.15 and returned at 7.45. How long was he gone? So that's the elapsed time, the timeline example. I include these others just to show you what other examples might look like. But like I said, in the standard itself, it says that they are only supposed to do when they're going to start, a start time and end time. Smith Smith started baking at 9.16. If she baked for six hours and 19 minutes, why was she baking that long? And when was she done? Um, so they would have to count up there. Mr. Johnson got home from work at 7 37 p.m. Before this, he had been driving Route 66 for one hour and 20 minutes and on Route 55 for 37 minutes when he did leave work. So not only is that 
a counting back problem, that's also a multi-step problem. And where do you work? I'm not quite sure where, how that physically makes sense that he was on that road for that long, but you know, I'm not going to judge. He has a provider um, So those are some examples. This first one is going to be what he, what they're going to see most often. So ways to practice this, IXL topic O is going to be for time. I think that even is going to, that is even going to include, um, <laughs> I just remembered that one. <laughs> um, topic O I think is even going to include reading an analog clock, so that might be a good place to start. If not, on IXL, which it does look like I'll have enough time, you can always go back into lower grades and find reading an analog clock. Um, you can use your daily routine to provide scenarios for your child, which the one I provided is just 3.35 p.m., but you get to bed at 7.45, so you can be well rested from the streets, school and workload tomorrow. How much time do you have before you have to go to sleep? So they can work that out. You can do that for really anything. You don't have to make it like them to your school. So that brings us to the end. I will kind of walk through um, both how to navigate by Excel and there was another thing I wanted to walk through, but I can't remember at this point. Um, so, but thank you for coming out. I really do appreciate it. Uh, like I said, we have not started any of this stuff other than multiplying the first part of multiplying, multiplying by one digit. Next week, I plan to. I will, while I was at my meeting, this afternoon, I was figuring out which book videos I'm going to be doing next week. Clearly, paid attention to music very well. Um, you shouldn't put this under. Yeah, yeah I just okay, realized wait, that. Wait, I, well, of course, pay lots of attention. I paid a lot of attention. <laughs> you might want to cut that out. Um, hey, I'll cut that out later. But uh, next week we will do, I'll show multiplying three digits by two digits in both traditional and lattice. The following week we will start on long division. Um, elapsed time will be towards the end of the advisory, um, somewhere somewhere between Thanksgiving and Christmas probably, or around the Thanksgiving. We will, probably, we will spend a lot of our time next advisory on multiplication long division, geometry, and a lot of time. So next homeschool connection night is 29th, that is going to be the reading one. Actually, all of fourth grade is doing this one at the same time, but all in our own rooms. Um, so hope to see you there, that one. That one is going to be after the bench, the reading, the math, and all the different benchmarks they have to take. So we will be able to kind of sit down and kind of talk about the data, like the patterns I saw, like what skills were challenging for the students, um, what they did really well on, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then the November one, the November math one will be about geometry. I haven't picked up a date quite yet though. Um, so to show you why it's up, it is, all right. Hey, real quick before you get into yeah. that. So the multiplication that you guys do, is it? It goes up to three by two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's it'll always be three by two. But some students can progress and sell right. another. But yeah, three by two. And then division is going to be three divided by one. Yeah. But again, some students will get themselves. I think the highest I a student ever got successfully was seven divided by three. <laughs> I was like, yes, <laughs> yes, that's correct. All right, so I excel. To get to it, you can simply do myxl.com or you can go to my website, press resources. The students all have their own logins. It is some variation of their first name, last initial, and either 471 or 544. I didn't choose their username, but they don't kind of have to work out. All their passwords are HTTP, or maybe not. I don't remember what all their passwords are. They all have so many different accounts, I don't remember all the passwords are. So they have both math and language arts. Our, we have we wrote a grant last year for IXL, and we have the math and the language arts, both of them. Our grant runs out in December, so I don't know if we will have IXL past December. I hope we do because it's a really good resource. Um, so language arts, this isn't going to help so much with um, comprehension. This is going to be more grammar skills, but language arts, you can see fourth grade skills. But I like IXL a lot more for math. Um, so math, you click on math, and you click on fourth grade skills and see more fourth grade skills, and you'll see it's all laid out. Then the letters don't necessarily have anything to do with like addition. You see as B, it's, so it doesn't really match up that way. But it will go from most common or 
most simplistic part all the way down to I think the last one's going to be like some stuff about decimals and probability. So it's going to kind of progress through the alphabet. Um, like I said, here for division, like what I was talking about, E1 is division facts, and E26 is going to be estimate quotient. So it's going to cover the gamut, everything that they're going to need about um, division. So just to see if I was. Yeah, okay. So for instance, the last time I said it might have, or the O might have reading clock. As far as I can tell there, it does not. So what you might want to do, if you need to, your child needs to work on reading clock, jump back to one of the other grades. You just have right the time. Reading clock. So second grade, defensively, Q has about reading clocks. Third grade might too, but I just have to put them on second grade. But you, you can jump around to it. If you want to align it direct, well, because ISL is aligned to Common Core standards, and Virginia doesn't use Common Core. We use the Virginia SOL standard. So if you want it to realign itself to be SOL, so you click where it says Virginia SOL, then you click the grade level. And then you see it gives you broken down by the SOL. So you see if they need to work on, all right, if they need to work on divide whole numbers, it's going to give you specific which ones they need to work on. Um, and occasionally, to kind of jump ahead a little bit, we will get to, at some point, uh, okay, right here. Here, it's going to say that you would need to jump up to fifth grade because that might be a common core skill that's in fifth grade but in Virginia it's fourth grade. And alternatively, sometimes you might have to jump down. But this will kind of align it to what they um, they need to be working on. And I know every week we work on a specific one. So if you're wondering which one they can do at home, you can just look at the lesson plans online. Okay, and you see this week we were working on IFL A6, that's a rounding one. So whatever I'm doing, whatever we're doing in class, much better, but that's a good one. And I think you can actually see, yeah, you can even see old lesson plans. So you can see what we've worked on in the past, and that will be helpful. I don't think you can see future ones. No, you can see future ones. Uh, so that's kind of a crash course on IXL. You can also, there is a way to get, if you press reports, it'll If you press reports, it will give you a detailed report of what your students have been working on, and it'll be what they've been working on at home and in school, and it'll give them trouble areas. I don't have a child in the class, so I can't really show you the version of that. Um, but to see the parent report, you still just log in as your child and press reports. So that's a good way to hold them accountable for if they're getting on IXL now. But all the different resources we have, OBMAX, Prodigy, all those different resources that they have to use. Are helpful. IXL, I find, is one of the best because you can target specific skills versus OBMAX and Prodigy is going to kind of review all the skills. IXL, you can target specific skills. So, questions? 